I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to The Sidebar, a weekly show on the community, arts, culture, and more. Today, we're talking to Stuart Harris, leader of the development group that recently bought the historic Steric building downtown. So stay with us for a conversation with Stuart. Stuart, thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks Te- for having me. Technically, it is your Stuart Harris of Constellation Properties. That's right. The new owner of the Steric building. That's correct. So for people who've, who've ever been downtown, seen the Steric building, which has been pretty much empty for 25 longer, plus longer. 1986. 86. Mm-hmm. What in the world are you thinking? <laughs> it's a great question. I, I, I say it's like the dog that bit the bumper. You know, once it did, it can't let go. There's no, no turning back. Uh, it's... Um, it's one of those projects where you know you look at the the Memphis skyline, and you see a number of skyscrapers as we maybe not by New York standards, but by Memphis standards, and you scan it and you say, "What? Which one looks different here? Um, that one looks yeah. different. Yeah. Um, that one's unique." And it, as you may know, um, this was the the tallest building in the South from uh, 1929 to 1957. So it was it it stood out like a sore thumb in a great way. Yeah. For, for many years in Memphis. And it was kind of the iconic first yeah. really, really big building in Memphis. It, it, it's beautiful. If you're into buildings, it's, it's right at what, uh, Je- uh not Jefferson, it's court and BB King and BB King. It's at Madison and BB King. Madison and BB King. Right. Um, and so people coming into downtown down Madison have driven past it and probably to a degree have looked past it. Right. Because it's right. been empty for so long. Um, We'll, we'll talk later about the, it was this very complicated ground lease situation, which is is interesting to me and to you, maybe not necessarily to everyone, but right. I guess the main th- twenty nine floors is that right? Yeah, that's 29 right. Twenty nine floors, about three hundred and forty thousand square feet total. That's give, right, give yep. or take. Um, the plan for it is what? The plan is being created right now. Um, we know the building is viable for reuse. Uh, the it'll be predominantly multifamily. But it will be mixed use. We're exploring a variety of options with, you know, with that many people that could live in it. It could have as many as 260 apartments if mm-hmm. it were predominantly apartments. Uh, it's going to need some retail component, some food and beverage component. Yeah. Uh, we're exploring what it would look like if it had some type of boutique hospitality as well. Uh, so it's it's um, it's sizable. It has enough scale to do that. Yeah, and all this would be done sometime next year. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, <laughs> I wish. Uh, the 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 plan would ideally be done by next yeah. year. Yeah. But as you know, this is a an interesting world we're living in right now with you know construction costs and labor costs and financing costs. financing costs yeah, and debt markets, all that stuff. It's really complicated. Plus, you then you layer on a, a project like this that um, is going to require uh, things like tax credits and yeah, um, you know, other abatement. Right, different incentives and things like that that it's it's going to require to get this building done. It's it's uh, the thing about the building is like I mentioned, it's it's doable. It's not a very efficient building. So when you look at a if, as a real estate person, you look and you say, all right, here's the the usable square footage and here's the rentable square footage. Uh, people weren't thinking about that as much in 1929. So it's we're going to have to really do a lot to most efficiently use the building. Had it. It has eight elevators, which you don't need eight elevators anymore. Why would it have eight elevators? Over 2,000 people a day working oh. in a vertical space. Okay. So were they the you full 29 floor elevators or was there like- There's a- four that would, four that service the, the, the lower tower, which is gotcha. from one to 14, 13, excuse me. And then the others that run the full length of the building up to 29. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it just, they had to move that many people yeah. up that many yeah. floors. Yeah. And uh, that's what. What was what office was it? A headquarters building? I should know. No, it, no, it was. Uh, you know, it, it was kind of the embodiment of the Roaring Twenties when okay. it was first opened, and it was a multi-tenant building. And they delivered it in the fourth quarter of 1929. Which, if, <laughs> good timing. Yeah, yeah, good timing. <laughs> the stock market crash of yeah, of, you know, in October of 29. So what was going to be delivered to great fanfare was delivered to like the world going yeah. to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it probably didn't find its heyday until the mid thirties. I know the FBI had, uh, several floors and like over 50 agents yeah. in the building. Um, I think IBM was there. Chrysler had an, a regional office there. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, it became, uh, it was a bit, it was a multi-tenant floor, multi-tenant yeah. building, excuse me, for, for most of its life. So one thing probably people listening are maybe, you know, not necessarily even a bad way, but maybe confused that you're, y'all bought a building 
without the plan for it. Yeah. You know, but why, why did, why is it working that way? Yeah. So you, you mentioned the ground lease issue and I'll, I'll try to make it as concise as I can, but basically the developer in 1926 entered an agreement with the family that owned the land, the heirs of the Napoleon Hill family. And rather than they wanted to buy the land, but the family didn't want to sell it. So they put it on a 99 year ground lease, which prevented it from, uh, from anything happening as the, as the, you know, the building was thriving. The people that owned it didn't care how long the ground lease was because they were going to be dead and gone when it expired. Yeah, right? right. Right. But as we got nearer and nearer to the, the, the expiration of that lease, everyone's scratching their heads saying, what's going to, what's going to happen to this thing? But no one was willing to invest in the building because if you invested in the building, all of the improvements would go back to the heirs of Napoleon yeah. Hill. Right. Yeah. So it didn't make any sense for people to put money into it. So this whole ownership structure held the building hostage. Even when much of the rest of downtown has experienced a renaissance, this one couldn't be done because it, it, because of that. Because so, of that, and, right. And so the fa- family, the Grosvenor family owned the building. Is that right? They own the land. The, on the land. That's right. Grosvenor family owned the land. And yep. it was, an, for a long time, it was like an insurance trust. That's right. A kind of yeah. big, generic. Equitable sort of, life insurance. Yeah. Okay. They foreclosed on it in 1973 and operated it. Okay. Until 86 when, you know, down, think about downtown depopulation in the 70s. Yeah. And it already had a bunch of deferred maintenance. It needed a bunch of work. It still does, obviously. And it, you couldn't justify the expense to do all that work to it. Yeah. And so y'all bought the building and the lease? Or what did, what did you buy? We uh, It's a complicated structure. Uh, it, we now own the land and the building f- fee simple. It's okay. the first time since the building was ever constructed. Yeah. It's never it's never been part of the land underneath it. So the first time in 94 years, yeah. the building belongs to the land and that lease was torn up. Okay. So it's just it's a cl- at this point we structured a deal with them um that that provided a clean way forward for this redevelopment. Yeah. So what we we said is all right, let's let's get the most complicated part of the of the of its hindrance in being redeveloped. Yeah. Um, and that was the fact that it it just it couldn't have been done without cleaning up the ownership. Let's get that box right. checked. We did plenty of due diligence, you know, over, well over a year. I mean, really, we've been at this for almost three years. But of intense due diligence, we got a you know forty plus page narrative from LRK on how to yeah move this thing forward and how to uh, how it can work. Uh, and we've worked with contractors and subs and engineers and all of that. But um, now's the time to figure out what the yeah. optimal mix is. Yeah. And, you, yeah. and, and to go back to your question of why, yeah, I yeah. think that's an important question. It's the, the how is what we're working on now. And we, we know that we wouldn't have bought it if it wasn't able to be redeveloped. But the why is a bigger question. And for us, it's as much of a social and cultural thing as it is a real estate transaction. And so we're trying to, with, with Constellation, we're trying to do is think about real estate less from a transactional viewpoint and more around human flourishing. So how do we create a network? If you think about a constellation, a constellation is um, a variety of things that can be disparate in distance and size and all that, but together they form an, an, a cohesive image. So that's kind of what, one reason why we even yeah. aimed at that. Cause we could take, you know, we've, we, we've, our group, uh, redeveloped the old Hickman building, which is now the Commonwealth. Yeah, right and in we, that neighborhood. That's right. Right, right on, on Madison, Madison and right next and to the downtown fourth. elementary. Right. Beautiful like renovation. There's apartments in there. There's offices in there. There's retail on the bottom. Yep, correct. Yeah. And so our, our thought is, is that what if we can reimagine, really think about real estate from a human flourishing standpoint? What are What are the types of things in the neighborhood? All right, well, we've got a ballpark that's currently where they're playing soccer in baseball. We've got a great YMCA. We've got the downtown elementary school, which is a great school. We've got visible music college. And then we've got kind of a random mix of underutilized flat surface parking lots that are- I mean, it's a dead zone. I mean, and I said that as somebody, we were talking about it before, and we've known each other for a while. The old Daily News office is um, uh, over at Jefferson and 3rd. Right. When Daily Memphian first launched, we were at the Crane Building. And it's just, you're sort of 
you know, all these great You're things no that happened land. downtown. The closest neat thing was what you all were doing at, at Commonwealth, yep. you know, from where we were. COVID obviously threw some of that stuff. And now it's, you know, back and in, in, in happening. But in the chess clubs over there and like there's this kind of activity. But for the 20 years I spent or I think it was about, you know, 16 years I spent over in that area, it was it was the land that time forgot for, in terms for of sure. any sort of development, just empty parking lots, except yep. on a baseball game. Um, not particularly so much dangerous or not, just abandoned. That's you right. know, people parking to go to jury duty. I mean, just a really empty dead yeah. zone. And we see that dead zone as opportunity because yeah. it, it, we feel like it's important connective tissue between investments that are being made in the downtown core and the riverfront and investments that are made by St. Jude investments that are made by, the medical in the medical district and the edge district, MMDC, all that, everything that's going on yeah. there and the stuff that's going on in the CBD. Well, this is a really, we think a really important connector. Yeah. And the fact that it is a dead zone means that from, in terms of displacement or gentrification, that's not really an issue. Right. Yeah, so, right. Our, so the task for us is to create an environment where we're, where it's, you know, it's, there's good social connections and the conditions are, are ripe for a, a variety of people to live yeah. and work in that area. And so we have a blank canvas to start with. And we have a, we have a model many years ago uh, when I was at Southern Sign Asset Management, uh, our CEO at the time, Michael Cook, or he's the CEO now, um, our CEO was very engaged with, uh, with a group called the Thriving Cities Group. They were born out of the Center for Advanced Studies and Culture at UVA. And they were looking at kind of how do you, how do you create a thriving culture. And they would say a city is a microcosm of a broader culture. Sure. It has all the yeah. measurements that you can look at and say, all right, th they would call them six endowments, the good, the true, the beautiful, the just, the sustainable, and the prosperous. So that covers everything from, uh, you know, a fair and just legal system, a uh, good political civ uh, civic life, art space, green space, music, mm -hmm. beauty, um, workforce development, all of that, you know, a holistic kind of view yeah. of, 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 uh, culture and that a city is a way to gauge that. And you could even drill that down in concentric circles and say, well, what, what would a neighborhood look like if it had these things? And I think our friends over at Crosstown have done an incredible job of embodying under one roof, the stuff that's that thriving cities would say are important for culture yeah. thriving. Right. So they've done that under one roof. What we're kind of thinking is, what if uh, we deconstruct that? It's not under one roof, but it's really kind of built around a few block radius. And that would be really hard to pull off if one of the most blighted pieces of real estate right. in that area stayed this huge blighted albatross right there at the corner of, of BB King. And Well, and, and, and that's true too. We're like our office, we're sitting down here at the world headquarters of the Daily Memphian, um, it, down by the Tennessee Brewery, down by the lofts on Tennessee Street and G. Patterson. And, you know, that right next to us, the Tennessee Brewery was a blighted empty building, building for however many decades and that it's not now and that that both it's occupied, which also there was some other construction that went in that kind of this neighborhood's fantastic. Yep. Right. I mean, in this neighborhood was not fantastic decades ago. It right. was most of these many of these buildings that are around us were empty or semi used or whatever. And now this whole South Main South Front kind of area has gotten so much better. Um Look, when we come back to all those themes for saying, let me do some quick housekeeping and tell everyone we're talking to Stuart Harris. Uh, he's leader of the development group that recently bought the historic Steric building downtown, which we'll talk to him more about. Um, this is The Sidebar, and I'm Eric Barnes. The Sidebar airs on WYXR 91.7 every Thursday at 1130. Um, it's focused on the community, arts, culture, everything in between. It's not just a radio show, though. It's one of many weekly podcasts we do at The Daily Memphian, including the Behind the Headlines podcast that we do with the folks at WKNO, Bill Dree's Politics podcast on the record. Uh, the Memphis Grizzlies podcast that Chris Harrington and Drew Hill do, um, and Jennifer Biggs and Chris Harrington's food podcast, Sound Bites, which also airs here on WYXR every Thursday at 11. All of our podcasts are on the Daily Memphian site, as well as iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get this show and uh, Sound Bites, both of the WYXR shows, at WYXR.org, or you can download the WYXR app. Um, that has all the talk shows, also has all the archived uh, music shows that are on WYXR. So you can, if you miss someone's show, you can listen to the whole thing uh, whenever you want. Um, I should also mention that WYXR is nonprofit listener supported radio. So if you can uh, do support WYXR, just go to the website. Uh, you can become a member. You can do a one-off donation. There's lots of member benefits. 
Um, and it is much appreciated if you can do that. Um, uh, uh, the sidebar, as I mentioned, every Thursday uh, coming up soon, we've got Kevin Thompson from Mosh, uh, the um, Pink Palace, Lichterman, the conglomeration of various museums and um, uh, cultural institutions. He's coming up next week. We recently had the folks from For the Kingdom on. Uh, they do a really amazing work with uh, mostly with youth and at-risk youth, food insecurity, cool training, job training, uh, really amazing mentoring, all kinds of amazing work they do mostly in Raleigh but also around the city. We also recently had Zoe Carr the relatively new head of the Brooks Museum on to talk about the new building but also all the um, great things that are going on at the Brooks and their old um, uh, existing facility in the park. Um, I mentioned behind the headlines the TV show we do at W what do we do? W we do a TV show right Natalie. It's called Television WKNO Behind the scenes on WKNO, uh, behind the headlines on WKNO, we uh, recently had Jim Strickland, Mayor of Memphis, on to talk about all kinds of things. And uh, coming up soon, we've got uh, members of the Memphis City Council talking about issues that are coming up, up in front of the council, budget, um, policing, and many, many other residency, many other things. We also have the folks from the Memphis airport uh, coming on. They have a new um, CEO coming in at the end of the year. Um, so we'll be talking to them about all kinds of changes and and where the airport stands. Um, and I mentioned the mayor and city council and so on. This is an election year. We recently did a debate with many of the uh, candidates for city mayor. If you missed that, you can still get it on YouTube. Just search for Daily Memphian and you'll find uh, the, the video of the debate. Or if you go to the Daily Memphian site and search for... Memphis mayor debate or mayoral debate. You should be able to find that. Um, Last, and I should always mention, um, do subscribe to the Daily Memphian. If you haven't subscribed, uh, we do appreciate your subscription. So, but we are here with Stuart Harris talking about um, not just the Steric building, but that whole neighborhood. So some of that, you know, that, that whole thing of, you know, Recreating the Crosstown is a great example. I, I, I mentioned way too many times probably that I've lived in Crosstown now coming up on six years, which mm. is crazy. Um, but I also think about like MMDC, like Memphis Medical District and Tommy Pacello who passed away, but who is for me the person who introduced me to this whole concept of the thing, kinds of things you're talking about that you could take street by street, block by block, sidewalk by sidewalk you could, you could transform neighborhoods. And, you know, he'd been part of helping with the, um, he would never have taken full credit, but I mean, he was definitely part of, you know, what was going on up in, um, Broad Avenue arts district. Yeah. Obviously when he passed away at way too young an age, um, he was head of the Memphis medical district and you see all that stuff sort of happening in this way where there are all these amazing assets, also all this vacant land, but then you can suddenly have the edge district and have some cool things happening and you, and things start to connect yep. through streetscape and, just simple things and also very expensive things for you with the steric and commonwealth right there. And that kind of, you know, big, just, I hate the word super block, but that big area that we're talking about, I mean, do you all have to buy every piece of land and, and every building in there to make change? Or is it about partnering with people? Is it the city? Is it DMC? Like it's how do you make the, all that? It's all of the above. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we've acquired what we feel like we can acquire for, current and future development with the Commonwealth near the next to the Commonwealth and the Steric. We've gotten, a, you know, bought a couple of parcels nearby for future yeah. development right now is not the time to do it right. with all this going on. But, um, really we, we care less about controlling the neighborhood as much as finding and partnering with people who also believe in our vision for human thriving and are thinking about the kinds of things we're thinking about in terms of, you know, sustainability and equitable, an equitable neighborhood and, and doing exactly what you mentioned that Tommy was so good at. And, yeah. and he really does deserve a lot of that credit because yeah. he, he was a visionary in that regard. And his legacy, I think is you're seeing it now and it's going to continue to go for many, many years, but it, it's putting one foot in front of the other and saying, let's tackle this instead of, you know, we, we can't, I'd, lo I'd love to win the Powerball and go do this whole thing. Right. Right. But right. that's just, that's not real life. Um, yeah. This is the kind of thing where we we have to take you know crawl before we walk, and that requires a lot of effort, a lot of concerted efforts. Kind of like the the acquisition of the Steric, while that was a super complicated deal. Thankfully, w every party in this project likes each other. Still, yeah. we all get along. Uh, yeah. The seller, the buyer, the lender, the city, the DMC. We're all you know. It was it was really uh, it ended up being a great thing instead of something that could have been super adversarial and was at times. Uh, it, it was something that we worked together, rode in the same direction, Paul Young and Brett Roller and Steve Barlow and 
uh, and uh, the mayor's office. And uh, just, there was just a lot of different people. Our, our council on all sides work together. It's going to require the same thing to get any of this stuff done. Yeah. And so yeah. you, you mentioned development down here in, in the South Main District. And, you know, we've, we're thinking about the Snuff District and South City and different projects, Orlean Station that, yeah. that Turley's done and, and, the, uh, and the, everything around kind of the Edge District. We, we couldn't be rooting more for projects like that to get done because it, it's more puzzle pieces. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. It's, it's, we're, fil- we're plugging in puzzle pieces. We just happen to believe that the verticality of the steric and that area, if we can go up a bit and really start to, to repopulate the streets there in, in the downtown core, kind of yeah. right off the main street corridor, you know, steric's 300 steps off of main, that kind of density is what downtown needs. Yeah. So we're for, for the sake of I mean, not, not only the, the retailers, let's say, you know, restaurants and things like that, but just anytime you're activating streets and you have people walking and that, that's, that's the best way to yeah. show that a city's live. And if you also think about what, you know, building like the steric that's tall, hundred North main, another one, imagine in a few years, if those things are lit yeah. day and night, you're coming into if you don't live downtown already, you come into downtown for a Grizzlies game or Redbirds game or the Orpheum or whatever, and then all of a sudden you see, yeah, a, a bunch of lights on that yeah. have not been on for for decades, and even when they those buildings were live and active, they weren't at night, and so, oh yeah, because they were offices, they're offices, yeah, and so yeah. It, it it brings a whole new dimension to downtown that it yeah. hasn't really known. Um, one. Uh, person over there i assume you know and have been talking to is bill townsend who yeah. recently bought um and Ans- the ansdale house Ans- why am I ansdale uh, mansion yeah. A- ansdale mansion sorry yeah. um right off central gardens and and um agnes and all that he owns the masonic temple over there he's been he bought the lucian theater formerly the yep. you know the x-rated movie theater that he's about oh, yeah. to announce something going on there um bill's been the savior of many historic many historic buildings I mean, and stuff in in victoria village and he also i mean just when you know, he was talking. Inter- uh, or Jane Roberts interviewed him for a great story about his both his life and how he came to do this and his story in Memphis, which was really amazing. But also, just you know, he does not want to gentrify. He does not want to tear up neighborhoods. He does not. He wants to do the right thing with right. his building. So Masonic Temple is right around the corner from yep. you all. He's got a similar vision for you all. So who? But then who? That, all, that's exactly the kind. It's of, the kind of person, about partnerships. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, Bill is exactly the kind of person that we would want to be working with to ensure that there's collaboration and, and that the pro- the projects are not contradicting each yeah, other, right? right? That they're complementary. And, you know, Bill is, has proven to kind of put his money where his mouth is in terms of saving these projects. Yes. And, and it, and he, it's ideal because those could go in the hands of, of a, of an out of town investor that could just basically hold the projects hostage. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and that's what we don't want. Yeah. That just, that, that kind of thing, Somebody without a vested interest and a stake in Memphis uh, is exactly what we don't want because they they don't have the same right sense right. of urgency. Well, in your case, did. you're a neighbor. Right, you're not just from Memphis. I mean, you're literally exactly. down the street. That's but right. the, who owns all the? I mean, all the surface lots are those sort of big like private equity land no. trust stuff, or are they are those accessible owners? You know, people you can get to and Depends. reason with. Yeah, there's there's uh, we've had some good conversations with some neighboring. Uh, landowners and some that are not that productive, you know, yeah, there's some yeah. that feel like they're sitting on land in midtown Manhattan and it's just, <laughs> <laughs> you and I both know that's not what it is. It's not what it is. And, yeah. and some, uh, are, are more reasonable and really want to make something work. Yeah. And the good news is, I mean, they're, we're in those discussions and yeah. maintain them. And like I said, we don't have to own it, but we'd love to have some input as a stakeholder in the neighborhood and what it would be. Yeah. Um, it is not – it's funny you brought up Snuff District and it, having – again, having spent much of my working life in Memphis in that neighborhood, right, walking by the steric and so on. It's not unlike the Snuff District in right. the sense that it's – there's a bunch of structures. It was completely empty but a few trucks going by. I mean it just it, – it, and yet it wasn't that far from a lot of really good stuff going right. on. I mean and that's – that's it's strange how little islands like that can be created so close to – Court Square, Square oh, yeah. which is thriving most days, you know, like, I mean, all kinds of really good stuff that's been going on. And you may time. remember from when your office was there in this area, yeah. 
ingress and egress is really good. Yes. Getting in and out, you don't, you're not stuck in, in, yes. you know, in eight story garages and waiting on a one, yeah. going in a one way street and then getting routed all over the place. It's, it's a great place to come in and out. And so we're looking at not only what does it look like if we have, you know, mixed use, mixed income, but also what if we develop this thing with, with a multimodal transit in mind? So we yeah. know that the light rail trolley or the tr- the tram is yeah. has been brought here and they're working on it, on electrifying the Madison track. I, and, Gary Rosenfeld was on behind the headlines within a month, last month and said it'll be within a year. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's exciting uh, to have a, my understanding is that it's going to be air conditioned and Wi-Fi enabled yeah. and more modernized. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen it with my own two eyes, which is great. They've been testing it. Yeah. Uh, between that and then, um, and then the possibilities of Court Avenue, which are just, you know, it's just like tumbleweeds right yeah. now, but what it could be yeah, is really interesting. And then Jefferson on the backside, yeah, which yeah. I, I think they're, my understanding is that there's some th- consideration for heavier bike traffic and some bike lanes yeah. on Jefferson. Yeah. Um, with a couple of minutes left, this, this was not, I mean, you got into this, um, you evolved, your career evolved into development, right? right? Is that the, the awkward way to say yeah, it? Yeah. T- you know, 20 years ago, I worked at CB Richard Ellis in the downtown okay. leasing office. And yeah. so, uh, Don Draker and I were going, uh, we were working for Ron Kastner at the time and we were going door to door trying to convince people to move into downtown, move their offices downtown if they weren't already there. Or we were going to 100 North Main trying to poach tenants to come to move to Peabody <laughs> Place or one Memphis place. And, yeah. the, you know, these these ambulance chasers were um, that were smoking cigarettes in their office, you know, that were neck deep in, in law library books. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're looking at us like you want us to pay double to. Yeah, right. To, to, to move into an office where we can't smoke. Yeah. And uh, and so things like that, we, you know, we, we were hoofing it up and down main street. And over that time, I just started developing a love for the character of downtown and the social friction of being in dense places. I mean, another thing we could talk about for, for hours is why people need to be back down here working. And yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be five days a week, right? But people need to be back in the office. In my opinion, I mean, I'm not finger wagging, but like it, it <laughs> culturally people need each other. Yeah. And that social friction is important. And so, um, Main Street needs to be yeah. busy again, but I love that social friction. I love seeing people that I know and being able to go into the little tea shop and s- step down to the rendezvous for Friday lunch and get some red yeah. beans and rice and and um and but also develop a love for the character of the buildings and the steric being in my mind the kind of the cream of the crop. Yeah, uh, that and and we're the, the building we bought or or two of the prettiest buildings I think some yeah. of them down here. And so we, you know, developed a love for the building, uh, stayed in real estate for several years and, um, worked at uh, Mercury investment management with Earl Blankenship for a while uh, when we rolled our firm into Southern Sun and was part of Southern Sun. And then, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So that, that was the evolution. Okay. That's right. And so we, we, um, cause when I met you really met you, I think you were at Southern Sun. So that's right. I more assumed you came from a finance background. No, actually. more yeah. a real estate background. Went and worked for Southern Sun starting in 2010, and the yeah. uh, Michael Cook and and the team at Southern Sun were really pivotal in that you know their 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 clients were mostly non Memphians, and so when they were coming to town, we were always taking bringing them down kind of to the cultural center to do stuff down yeah. here. We were officing at Poplar Ridgeway in a great office, but um, you know these people were coming from London and Sydney and San Francisco and Chicago. They want to see a city. Yeah, right. And yeah. so we were coming down here and we're like, well, let's. What if we move our office downtown, but not just move our office? What if we kind of, yeah, put this whole thriving cities model to practice and say, well, let's take some blight. Yeah, and, you know. And, it, and so it wasn't Southern Sun that bought the building, but but Michael is a, is a, is the primary investor, and and some of our partners there invest in that project, move the firm down. Michael and his wife and family sold their house out east and moved down to the Commonwealth. Yeah. So I like to say they, they literally and figuratively planted a flag in the neighborhood. Right. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, putting this thriving cities model to practice. And I don't think this, I don't think Steric would have happened had we not done right. that first. I mean, you know? yeah, we, well, it's like, it's like so many of these developers, they do one and then they get the bug and then it, it keeps going on. We're out of time though. Yep. Uh, last question I always try to ask, um, what was the first concert you ever saw? Um, it's great. Uh, you too. Pop Mart. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Where? Here in Memphis? Uh, here in Memphis at the Liberty Bowl and then in New Orleans, same year at the Superdome. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's good. On my birthday. 
Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, that's the first you too, I think. Yeah. Um, Stuart Harris, uh, thanks so much. People can learn more. Uh, we wrote about the Sterk building in the Daily Memphian. But that is all the time we have this. Reminder, the sidebar airs every Thursday at 1130 on WYXR 91.7. Missed any of the show, you can get the full podcast on the Daily Memphian site, WYXR, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>